Attack on Titan is officially in its fourth season and they just got done releasing part two of that season. Yes, fans have been rocked, rattled by the news that there is going to be a part three to a season, but I guess Attack on Titan fans are used to such shenanigans. But that shall play no factor in my uh, thoughts and discussion on the actual contents of said part two. And instead, let's go ahead and get on into it with a spoiler warning for Attack on Titan up to part two of season four, and I would say a good bit into it, but let's go ahead and talk about the experiential side of this show because Attack on Titan has matured since its first season aired in some pretty stunning ways. Not only in, I find, the animation style and presentation, granted there are still some problems we'll get into there, but in how it actually moves its story forward and the handling of its characters. For me, the two greatest elements to Attack on Titan are characters and story. There seems to be a devotion to establishing and understanding every single player's ideology and then breaking it. Because Attack on Titan has quite heavily used a form of conflict development where you break a character's ideology. You push them to a point where they either need to just become an extremist to keep doing what they're doing or switch sides. This results in not only kind of inherently dynamic characters, but so much personal conflict within the larger conflicts going on based on ideologies. People who train together were brothers or sisters having to brutally murder each other on the battlefield. And there's also this almost tiered like structure to the conflict going on as well that is delicious to consume, where we see very deliberately ranks of people making decisions and then those beneath them having to react and deal with the ramifications of those actions. And it feels so viscerally unfair sometimes to see people who did not make the calls, did not want things to happen, now be thrust into the heart of them, die, be forced to bloody their hands and that leads us back into character where so many of them are just soaked in blood, literally and metaphorically. Attack on Titan also does a beautiful job of playing with information and how withholding information or leaders telling half-truths can result in so much devastation. When with the obvious imagery related to all kinds of real-life fascist people in the real world, it hits really close to home and how people can be convinced to do terrible, terrible things when they're fed propaganda and propaganda and propaganda and shown these twisted truths to warp them into your willing, awful, awful soldiers. I was trying to think of characters that I found to be completely innocent this late in the game and I kind of Falco, I, I, maybe, and in Yonkapon, I, I think, one, I'm probably saying his name wrong, but I think he's also relatively bloodless. It's challenging its viewers to find anyone who hasn't made a mistake and offering them essentially nothing. We occasionally get characters who are taking a stand once they're on the right side and making these self-sacrifices, but even then Attack on Titan is so conscious to constantly remind you that the people caught up in conflicts on either side very often don't want to be there really. There was even a frame that they did as one of like the in-between act panels that kind of in detail went into the idea that violence and the othering of people it's this one right here and it felt like they were having to take a step back and just like tell people hey this is supposed to be bad I don't know if you figured that out. We've seen Aaron Yeager go from a kid we felt bad for to literally a genocidal maniac. And the fact that the show is taking the time to show those closest to him turning on him and being like, we have to take him down. And only those that remain loyal to Aaron are the fanatical, hateable characters. I'm like, yeah, this makes sense. And let's get into the Yeager brothers because I think my biggest criticisms are gonna come in here. I really love Attack on Titan 
when it is exploring ideologies of warfare, consequences of bloodshed. I think it has so much to say. And then it gets bogged down in the fantastical elements. And this is especially clear where the Jaeger brothers kind of went into this separate dimension where all of time is happening at once and for infinity, which is a cool concept, but it was so disjointed and so clearly used as an excuse to move the narrative along and too overtly tell people what exactly was going on that those were just my least favorite episodes of Attack on Titan in a while. Granted, I still felt emotion during them. Like some of the reveals and especially the history were shown of how this whole process started through the abuse of this slave girl was just gut-wrenching. I mean, this is a world bathing in blood that has tried to scapegoat the consequences of the wars that came before and ignored victims of these crimes, and that manifests and turns almost cancerous, and the end result you get is what's happening in Attack on Titan. If I had to dumb down and just try and make the thesis of Attack on Titan, a simple sentence, which I do not think you should necessarily do, but the biggest takeaway for me is the avoidance of consequences will always lead to greater travesties. And so it is your responsibility to make sure those in power are always looking out for those who are suffering the most. Because if you try to just bury the problems, they come back bigger, badder, and harder. And again, what's antithetical to that, which the show is really laying into at this point, is things like nationalism, which are all about trying to ignore realities and make yourself feel special and better and not value fellow humans on the same level as yourself, which of course is just all over the place in Attack on Titan and is why so many of the people were now being forced to consider heroes did such terrible things before and they're having to come to terms with the blood on their hands. Now, I would not be doing my job at this point if I did not take the time to note that there is quite a lot of loud voices within the fandom that has read the manga that has said the very end, which we have yet to get, is not handled well, especially when it comes around these themes. And I even had this brief conversation on Twitter with someone that I think makes some points, and I can't speak on the matter because I am not Jewish and I do not feel comfortable doing so, and I have not read the manga. I am purely going off of the show. I have no intention of reading the manga. It's just not on my TBR. So as much as I'm enjoying that conversation now, it is worth noting that a lot of people, especially those that this directly affects, are saying it doesn't land well. But all right, but let's get into a couple more criticisms here. Well, I absolutely love the overall story. I do not feel Attack on Titans final season would be able to touch all of the points it needs to without the just grotesque amount of exposition dumping that's happening from a character perspective. We are again and again and again getting scenes with characters where they are essentially saying, here's what I believed before, here's how I changed my mind, I'm very sorry, and here's what I believe now. And that just keeps happening. And it's like, that's not how people talk or behave. So narratively, they're utilizing that crutch to try and leverage in these characters who have gone through these arcs to place them where they need to be to continue forward. I just wish a little more tact would be used in conveying the exact reasoning for these transitions rather than just monologue it. Moving on. And getting back to the animation, there was just a few scenes where it felt like either the animation studio was time crunched or ran out of money and what they decided to do was just put in awkward either animation movement that felt totally disjointed from the world around it. I'm especially thinking of some horses coming over a hill that were just kind of bobbing like this with the people. Or they'll just show like trees while people are talking and keep cutting to different trees instead of having to animate faces and expressions, it really felt like they just came down to the wire and were like, okay, we've done a great job a lot of other places, but this is airing in a week and we gotta finish up. So 
t -t tree, trees, trees. But I find that to be vastly outweighed by the scenes where the animation shines through uh, magnificently. And there is a usage of the camera, except the camera doesn't actually exist here, but they are animating Attack on Titan in ways where the camera is moving through the streets and following characters and showing perspective and scale, obviously not in reality scale, trying to make it look even more uh, extreme as a human on the ground would see things because panic and fear, and that is so tangible. And this same devotion to that intensity has been just redoubled with the violence. Now we're seeing more fights where we're on Titan's side. And there's been this switch flipped where now deaths are just so quick yet impactful. Whereas before we would get these like, oh no, drawn out deaths from characters. Now you're just seeing like wires get swatted and people spike into the ground. And instead of making a big show about it, there'll be a quick cut away. And that's almost more impactful because we know the people who are doing this are so emotionally conflicted. It felt like to me, them as characters are flinching away from the violence more. The only person who seems to be just entering this Terminator state of just going through and feeling nothing is Mikasa. She has just been pushed to a point where she is so clearly in the bigger picture while being forced down a tier. If you know what I'm talking about, where like, yes, there's those people at the top making the decisions like Aaron who are sending out those ripples and Mikasa is in those ripples, but she's heading towards the center like a missile and watching her just murder her way towards that center. I cannot wait to see where that is headed because the ultimate ending for Aaron is having her motherfucking kill him. I'm also really interested to see where this season is going to finish its conversation on trauma versus obedience, where it's a real world thing, where if people are severely traumatized or forced to stay in abusive situations, unfortunately, they'll often just start giving in and doing whatever to avoid more violence or in some twisted wrong loyalty to their abuser. Obviously, Mikasa, is riding a similar line there, and we see a reflection with the first Titan. But we are directly told repeatedly, there is no inherently subservient people. That is not the case. There is trauma, there is abuse, there is exploitation, and there is overcoming that. And having Mikasa overcome that would make me so happy. I think my final complaint is going to tie into one I've had about Attack on Titans and a few other anime slash mangas before where the pacing, uh, it, it feels like there's just so much being drawn out that if you took away half of the super long shots or repeated information or the show being a bit too indulgent, this would be half the number of episodes it is. But maybe because I've gotten through all of One Piece and I've been watching a lot more of this content, it's certainly not bothering me as much as it once did. Actually, I think it's just because the animation is so much more enjoyable to watch. But I'd be remiss if I did not talk about what happened at the docks in the last couple of episodes. So I'm going to put a spoiler warning for pretty much the end of the season that we have gotten up until this point. Obviously, this season's not done, but I'm talking to the end of part two. Let's go. So the setup is a pretty great action set piece where there is a plane that could be used to catch this invading force of the rumbling, tumbling, bumbling <laughs> that's going towards the continent, and it needs half a day to be set up. Our heroes have begun attacking this town, but did not know it needs half a day. So this siege essentially has ignited because their ploy to try and act like, we're still on your side, did not work. And they realize they actually need to hijack a boat and take the plane out to another base where they can then set it up and take off from because reinforcements are on the way. The action here wasn't the best the season had to offer, but it was damn good. And man, I will never ever get tired of watching gear just fly around. It's so cool. It makes me feel like I could be Spider-Man. But the emotional impact of what's happening here was just an exquisite display for where each of our protagonists at this point point is resting because Aaron is officially just fully flipped into the antagonist. We haven't even heard from him for like six episodes at this point. And instead we see where everyone's mental state is. There's even a showdown on a dock where once the uh, guise of still being on Aaron's side is ripped away, where we watch low level foot soldiers have to just brutally murder each other. And we watch Falco get shot in the face repeatedly. And of course he's a Titan, he's healing, but it's still so impactful to see an adult soldier shooting a child soldier essentially because you look
looks like a kid, to me at least anyway still. I don't know his exact age. And there's this just visceral showdown at the same time where these great ideologies are playing out. And that's kind of that tiered down thing I'm talking about. Then there's the Titans who show themselves to try and buy enough time to get to the ship, to get off. And they're fighting who used to be our like hero positions, like these elite soldiers flying around. Now we're watching them just get torn to shreds. And Migas is just working her way through them. And that's what I'm talking about. She just seems numb, just on a mission to get to Eren. They manage to get on the boat after Falco's Titan loses control and they manage to take him down and everyone's on board, all right, except for one who stays behind and he actually meets up with a traitorous soldier who realized like, no, Eren's not on the right. He blew up a train. And there's this moment where they infiltrate the ship that could deploy to chase down the ship that was stolen and sink it. And it's just two old men talking about what caused them to flip sides. And it was this wonderful, uh, just little scene that displayed why Attack on Titan uh, believes what it believes. And it's getting down to humanity. The devaluation of human life, where the person who turned traitor and just blew up a train full of reinforcements said, I was ignoring my conscience and not realizing, not processing the fact that these were kids that I was dealing with because he was a trainer and we've seen him train. And he's like, I, I knew it was wrong. I just did it. And it wasn't until I saw my students resisting, working against this, that I realized, oh my God, I, I dehumanized everyone around me. And I don't know, there's this mutual respect between these two veterans who just met each other and it, it caused me to just be completely still while I watched it. I had this just moment of reverence for the artistry of earning that scene. Great. And they blow up that ship on a suicide mission to save the rest. And from there, we get an episode where we kind of see the last time Aaron came uh, to the main continent and how impactful that was on him. And there's this moment where, you know, Mikasa and him are having this conversation and she clearly is blaming herself for not maybe reaching out to Aaron more in some way. And I really did not like that. I, I thought, I felt she was at a point as a character where she wouldn't be blaming herself or questioning her own actions. And she would realize Aaron's just a fucking monster. And I hope by the end of this season, she has completely done away with that and just realizes you can't stop people from being what they're gonna be sometimes. And Aaron is one of those cases. He's a cancer. That's the end result of a lot of crimes on all kinds of different sides, but that doesn't take away from the fact that he has just become something that needs to be put down. He wants to do a global genocide. That's a no. That's an absolutely you're done. And then the part two of this season ends with us seeing just an unbelievable wall of tight Titans arrive on the main continent and just start pushing their way over a city. And it is truly going to be a trampling. There is not going to be anything left with creatures of this size just moving through the world, my lord. And behind them, even bigger on a whole other scale of size is the new Aaron. All I can say is I really hope the show sticks the landing. I do not give numbered ratings for unfinished stories, so I'm not going to say where this falls in a scale of one to 10, though I think they have earned a great ending. It's all about seeing how those feet will stick. And there's certainly a lot of ways that a knee could buckle. So I'm buckling on in and waiting to see. But that leaves me to ask you, the audience, what have you thought of Attack on Titan season four, part two? Did you love it? Did you hate it? What? Should I review next? Apparently I'm going into Anthony Fantano zone here. I guess I'll, I'll give it a rating. I'll go for Jeremy Janes and say, it's a good time, no alcohol required. That way I don't have to give it a number. Um, check out my second channel, my friend Noah King. It's a good old time. Here's a clip. Just in case uh, the audience wanted to know, I have absolutely terrible hip mobility. If, if there were like a, a competition to like save people's lives, and it depended on me being able to hula hoop, I would kill so many people. <laughs> Books, merch, bye.